usually shower and shave before recording a message. But many of the comforts of society don't exist out here in the wilderness. It's only in the difficult times that many spiritual lessons are learned. If you want to get closer to Jesus, you have to toss your mattress, take up your cross. That was the heart of last week's message. The woman who touched the hem of Jesus' garment had to depart from her comfort zone to get close to him. But she came away with a new understanding of God's loving heart and of her own worth. Today we're going to look at Hagar. She was totally blindsided, rejected, and suddenly cast far away from everything familiar and comfortable. But out here in the painful wilderness, she discovered more about God and about herself than she could have ever known otherwise. Listen as Heather Zimple, one of the pastors at National Community Church in Washington, D.C., unfolds the story. God sees you. I don't care what wilderness you're in or how long you've been there, he sees you. I don't know if you're in the wilderness that's the painful consequences of your own choices or you're in a wilderness of pain that's been inflicted on you by someone else. God sees you and he hears you. You may feel like you're invisible, but God sees you. You may feel like you don't have another tear left in you to cry. God hears you. You may feel like you are staring into the nothingness of scarcity. God will provide. You may feel like you're all alone. God is with you. And you may feel like you're facing the irreversible. But maybe God has great things in store for you. You may feel like you're facing a big Mess. In fact, you may be here this weekend hoping to hear something that will spring you out of the mess that you're in. And, and you might not get a quick fix for that, but you are in good company because God's people are no strangers to mess. I mean, if we go all the way back to the beginning, God created everything and it was good. And it took us three chapters to mess it all up. I mean, Abraham and I mean, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden messed up Eden for all of us. And, and then we have Cain and Abel. I would say that jealousy and murder amounts to mess. And then we have Noah bringing all those animals into that boat. I've got to imagine there was some sort of mess created there. And Abraham, we'll get to his mess in a minute. But Isaac and Jacob play favorites with their kids and it causes all kinds of sibling rivalry and mess. And then Moses leading the people of Israel out of slavery and into the promised land. And they complain that they don't have the good food to eat. It's a mess. And then you get to David. Da I mean, David was a relational mess. I mean, David and Saul, David and Bathsheba, David and Nathan, David and Absalom. David's life is like a lifetime miniseries. It's a mess. And then you think that when Jesus shows up, Jesus will clean it all up, right? And yet he's born in a stone feeding trough for animals. And then he starts his ministry and he gathers these people around him to follow him. And they're, they're fishermen and they're tax collectors and they're political revolutionaries. And they argue with one another about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. And then the church begins. The church is a big mess. I mean, let's just take Corinth, for example. In the church in Corinth, there was sexual promiscuity, there was incest, there were people fighting about doctrine and fighting about what they could eat and what they couldn't eat, and there was idol worship, and there were lawsuits, and there were people getting drunk off communion. Now, come on, you know you're in a mess when people are getting drunk off communion. <laughs> and it was obviously before they had invented those little plastic shot glasses with the grape juice. God's people are no strangers to mess, and yet what we find in this whole story, what we see emerging, the thread that weaves in and out of these messes is the fingerprint of God writing his story of hope and redemption against the backdrop and through people of mess. God shows up. I think a lot of times when we think about the Bible, we think about it as a, as a good collection of morality tales where there are heroes and villains and where there are questions um, that, that are answered, where we get all the answers to life's big, big questions, what, you know? 
And, and yet it seems to me if I read this Bible honestly and thoroughly that sometimes it raises more questions than it answers. Like why bad things happen to good people or why good things happen to bad people or why sometimes God swoops in to save and other times he just sits back and watches. And we get to this story of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and Ishmael and Isaac, and it is one of the biggest messes that we find in the Bible. We find this elderly couple who can't have a child, and then Hagar, the slave woman, and then Ishmael, this boy born into chaos and tension, dealt a hand that he didn't ask for. But what we find in this is that even though the people of God are no stranger to mess, God isn't a stranger to mess either. In fact, that's the place that we most often find him right in the middle. In fact, it's in the midst of mess that God has a tendency to show up and show off most often. See, I think sometimes we come to this story of, of Abraham and we try to sort it all out theologically. Maybe we even try to sort it out politically. We try to assign labels like who is the hero and who is the villain and what is faith and what is doubt and what's righteousness and what's evil and who are the winners and who are the losers and where's the blessing and the curse. And it seems that God just isn't as concerned with all those labels. He's just concerned with showing up. And he's concerned with letting the spotlight shine on his sovereignty and his faithfulness and his ability to bring about his purposes and his timing and in his ways. And what we find is that God is the only hero of the story. Mess is one of the environments in which God works and often it happens out in the wilderness. And when we think about the great names of the Bible, the ones that we recognize, I mean, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Elijah, even Jesus, they all spent time in the wilderness. I mean, we're so busy praying for God's favor on our lives and we forget that some of the ways he works the most in us is when we're in the wilderness. Sometimes we're in the wilderness because our choices have led us there. Sometimes we're in the wilderness because God has sovereignly and divinely led us to that place. Sometimes we're in the wilderness because life just dropped us there. Sometimes we're in the wilderness because somebody else's insecurity and pride has hurled us out into that place. But regardless of how you've got there, regardless of why you're there, God is also there. Now, if you have your Bibles with you this weekend, turn over to Genesis 16. That's where we're going to be. But there's a lot of backstory to the story that we just saw. There's a lot of, of just introduction stuff that will help us make the story we just saw make sense. So if I could back up actually all the way to Genesis 12, we see that God shows up and speaks to a man by the name of Abram. Now, Abram is married to a woman named Sarai, and their names get changed later in the story to Abraham and Sarah. So just to avoid confusion, I'm just going to start calling them by those names. So God shows up to Abraham and tells him, I'm going to make you the father of a great nation, and through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And this is a big deal, and it's especially a big deal because Abraham doesn't have any children. And he's like in his 60s. And so God says, I'm going to bless you. Just go where I tell you to go. And so Abraham packs up his wife. He packs up his servants. He packs up all that he has, and he begins to go where God tells him to go. And then in Genesis 13, God shows up again and says, hey, Abraham, remember that promise I made you? This is the land that I'm going to give you and that your people will inhabit. And then in Genesis 15, God drags Abraham outside and says, look up to the stars and try to count them. I dare you to count them. That's how numerous your descendants will be. And Abraham still has no children. It's interesting because at, at this moment it says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And yet at the same time, I've got to imagine the promise just keeps coming up over and over and over again. And yet there's no fulfillment. <laughs> 
this point, Abraham is getting pretty old. And he and his wife, Sarah, have walked through infertility for not just years, but decades. And so by the time we get to Genesis 16, Abraham is beginning to weigh his options. He believes God, but he starts to weigh his options. And so Sarah comes to him and says, why don't you take my servant girl, Hagar, and maybe we can have a family through her. Now, on one hand, we can't, like, what in the world is Abraham thinking? What in the world is Sarah <laughs> thinking? But before we're too quick to cast judgment or ask questions, there, it's important to understand that at this time in history, in this culture, that was a normal practice. Especially if a couple had been walking through barrenness for this long, it was a common practice to take another and to have a family through the other woman. Now, the outcomes that we see when this happens in the Bible are always disastrous. But it wasn't as though Abraham was outright disobeying a command of God at this point. He's just weighing his options. And so in Genesis 16, Hagar, the servant girl, turns up pregnant. Now, we don't know at what point Hagar became property of Abraham and Sarah. We don't know for sure at what point she became a part of their story. But she's blessed. And so what happens then is Hagar shows up pregnant and begins to flaunt that before Sarah and makes Sarah angry. And so in Genesis 16, verse 6, we read this, then Sarah treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. Okay, this is the first time that Hagar goes to the wilderness. She actually goes to the wilderness twice. The film that we just saw is the account of the second time she went to the wilderness. This is all still backstory. So Hagar goes to, she runs away. The angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness along the road to shore. The angel said to her, Hagar, Sarah's servant, where have you come from and where are you going? Now notice the text doesn't just say an angel showed up, but the angel of the Lord. And when this shows up in the Bible, what it means is that God himself has shown up. And so God himself shows up and, and he shows up to Hagar. He speaks to Hagar. He even calls her by her name. He says, where are you going? And, and she says, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah, she replied. I would too. But let's just pause for a moment and, and look at these two women because if we only understand what we see in the story in the film, then, then Sarah looks just pure evil. I mean, what mother would send any other child away to their death? And so I think it's helpful for us to rewind a little bit and understand a little bit about the pain in Sarah's life. She's been dragged around by her husband from here and there to everywhere. She's been abducted by two different kings, walked in barrenness for decades, which at that time in history was understood to be a curse from God. And while God has shown up to tell her husband, I have great things in store for you, I'm going to bless you, and he's made a promise to Abraham over and over again, from what we can tell, we have no idea if God has ever spoken one word to Sarah. And so when this girl shows up and starts flaunting her blessing before Sarah, she starts to feel that pain a little more acutely that she's been walking with her whole life. Because Sarah hasn't just been exposed to those sometimes awkward and probing questions that sometimes come from a genuine curiosity, sometimes come with a flavor of a suspicion of judgment. Hey, Sarah, when, when are you guys going to have kids? Hey, Sarah, do you, do you, are you an Abraham? Do you, do you guys want to have kids? Hey, Sarah, you're um, getting up there in your 80s now. <laughs> you know, might be time to start thinking about having a family. I mean, it wasn't just that. It was understood to be God's curse on her life. And so when Hagar shows up and kind of shoves Sarah's nose even deeper into the pain of what she cannot do, all of those years and years of pain just begin to flood out of her. And she begins to mistreat Hagar. And then you've got Hagar. She's a slave. 
She's invisible except for what she can do for Abraham and Sarah. She's a pawn in their plan. According to the law at that time, um, she, she could have had the baby and then Sarah would have been in, all, in, in, in total rights to take that baby and then to sell Hagar off to someone else. What about Hagar's life? What about her dreams of a family? Is there any notice at all given, attention at all given to what Hagar wanted out of all of this? And then she finds herself mistreated because she was actually successful at doing what her mistress wanted her to do. And she's in the wilderness, pregnant. This is two women, both navigating their own wilderness of pain. And the reality is, I think there's a little bit of Sarah and there's a little bit of Hagar in all of us. And so she's, She's running and God shows up and the angel of the Lord said to her, verse nine, return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. And the angel also said, you are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord has heard your cry of distress. This son of yours... He'll be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey. He will raise his fist against everyone, and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against all his relatives. Even we're seeing this, this is not getting, it's going to get messier before it gets prettier. Thereafter, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord. She said, you are the God who sees me. She also said, have I truly seen the one who sees me? Hagar ran to the wilderness to hide, but God found her there. He's so good at doing that. I mean, Moses ran to the wilderness to hide in embarrassment, and God showed up in a burning bush. David ran to escape execution and God found him there and strengthened him there. Elijah ran to the wilderness just completely worn out and God spoke to him in a still small voice. Jesus went to the wilderness to pray and God met him there. God finds us in the wilderness. See, I think sometimes we we go to the wilderness because we want to hide from everybody, even God, especially God. And then it's as though God shows up just like he did in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, and he says, where are you? Or like to Hagar, he says, where are you going? And I don't think it's that God needs to know our latitudinal and longitudinal coordinates. He's wanting to let us know that he is looking for us, that he is the one who incessantly seeks and will find us. Even in the far reaches of the wilderness, God sees you. And so Hagar returns she gave God a name. This is the only place in scripture where we see someone giving God a name. Usually God is revealing his name to people. But here Hagar gives God a name and she says, you're the God who sees. And then miraculously she obeys God. Maybe this is the first free decision she has ever been able to make in her life. And she runs right back into the mess. And months later Ishmael is born and she names him God hears because it's not just that he sees you he hears you Abraham is now 86 years old he loves Ishmael and the Bible skips 13 years like when we go to the very next verse it skips 13 years and in this time Ishmael has began to talk and take steps and grow into a young man and Abraham loves this only son he listens to his first words. He watches his first steps and he loves this kid. And then God shows up again. 13 years later and says, Abraham, remember the promise I made to you. It's gonna happen. And I'm gonna bless Sarah and she's going to have a child. And Abraham is like, time out. 
Can Ishmael be the, the son of promise? And God says, I'm going to bless Ishmael, but the promise will come to Isaac. And this is the point where the film that we saw begins. And we pick up the story in Genesis 21. Isaac is born, the son of promise. And we read in verse 9, But Sarah saw Ishmael, the son of Abraham, and her Egyptian servant Hagar, making fun of her son Isaac. Now just a quick note about the text here. In the original, I'm, I'm using the New Living Translation this weekend, um, but in the original language, there's some uncertainty about what that word means. It could mean that he was laughing at Isaac. It could mean he was laughing with Isaac, like he was just playing with a baby. We're not sure from the text. But one way or the other, this didn't sit well with Sarah. And so she turned to Abraham and demanded, get rid of that slave woman and her son. He is not going to share the inheritance with my son Isaac. I won't have it. This upset Abraham very much because Ishmael was his son. But God told Abraham, do not be upset over the boy and your servant. Do whatever Sarah tells you to do, for Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. But I will also make a nation of the descendants of Hagar's son, because he is your son too. So Abraham got up early the next morning, prepared food and a container of water, and strapped them on Hagar's shoulders. Then he sent her away with their son. And she wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba. Hagar is the first single mom we see in the Bible. And she's wandering in the wilderness, away from everything she's ever known. The first time she ran to hide, this time she has been thrown out, away from comfort, away from security. She's got to care for herself. She's got to care for her son. And they come to the point of near death. When the water was gone, she put the boy in the shade of a bush. Then she went and sat down by herself about a hundred yards away. I don't want to watch the boy die, she said. And she burst into tears. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven, Hagar, what's wrong? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Go to him and comfort him, for I will make a great nation from his descendants. Then God opened Hagar's eyes, and she saw a well full of water. She quickly filled her water container and gave the boy a drink, and God was with the boy as he grew up in the wilderness. got to wonder what this was like for Hagar. She's in this predicament because of Sarah's insecurity. She's, she's been expelled from her home because of Sarah's insecurity. She was pregnant in the first place because of Sarah's instruction. And, and, and yet Sarah is still the one that God is going to send his promise through. That's incredibly confusing. But then we could also flip the story and think about Sarah's insecurity. Sarah's been faithful to Abraham and walking with Abraham in obedience to a God that perhaps she's never even heard speak to her. And yet God chooses to bless another. And I think one of the hardest things about the Bible and one of the hardest things about following Christ is that sometimes God chooses to bless those that we would consider to be our enemies. In fact, here's, here's one way that I know I have made God in my own image. When I think that God loves the same people I love and hates the same people I hate, I've made God my own image. And when I think that God should bless those that I deem worthy of blessing and he should judge those that I deem worthy of judgment, I've made God in my own image. Meanwhile, God just shows up. See, we look at it and we say, nothing in this story is fair. And God steps in and says, it's not fairness that I'm bringing, it's grace that I'm bringing. It's grace. 
And I will bring bring blessing and I will bring promise and I will bring my presence and I will see and I will hear and I will be with. Hagar is visited by God a second time in the wilderness. God shows up to Hagar not just once, twice. And in both instances, tell us, I see you. And he hears her and he's with her and he provides for her. Sometimes we wind up in the wilderness because of a choice that we've made. Sometimes God divinely, sovereignly leads us into the wilderness for a season to grow our character. Sometimes life just drops us in the wilderness. And sometimes we're sent to the wilderness because of mistakes of other people and evil that they've inflicted upon us. But it doesn't matter how we got there. It doesn't matter why we're there. God sees us, he hears us, and he's with us. Now, as this story continues to play out in Scripture, it is a big, big mess. Ishmael and Isaac meet up again to bury Abraham upon the, the time of his death. And then, and then Isaac has these two kids, Jacob and Esau. And Esau gets really ticked at his dad. And so in order to, to, to get back at his dad, he goes off and marries one of Ishmael's daughters. And then the other son, Jacob, has 12 kids. And those kids get mad at one of their brothers. So they sell their brother into slavery to some Ishmaelite traders. And on and on and back and forth. It continues to go throughout the pages of Scripture. And then finally, Jesus shows up. That promise he made to Abraham eons ago. I'm going to bless you and the promise of my redemption is going to come through you. And Jesus shows up and it has nothing to do with what Abraham did right or did not do right and everything to do with God's goodness and faithfulness and sovereignty and his ability to work through the mess of our lives. And when Jesus shows up, he makes a way through the wilderness for all of us. Because in the wilderness, we can find the cross. The cross is what gives us the opportunity to be reconciled with God. The cross is where we find relationship with God. The cross is where we can find blessing. The cross is what gives us hope. And if you've never been to the cross, I encourage you this weekend, across all of our locations, do not leave without talking to a campus pastor, a connections leader, somebody you came with, somebody. Find the cross. I don't care what wilderness you're in. Jesus will meet you there. And he makes a way. And Jesus is the hero of every story. In a world that's broken, hurting, sometimes feel like it's falling completely apart, God sees and he hears. He's with. He provides. See, God's not really in the game of assigning labels of heroes and villains. And and God's not up in heaven um, desperately wringing his hands to try to figure out what we're going to do next so he can determine his next action. He just shows up. No matter what wilderness you're in, he sees you, he hears you, he is with you, and he is standing ready to show up and show off in your life. God, I I don't know what wilderness people are walking around in this weekend, but you know it because you see it. And God, I don't know what it is that people are wrestling with and, and, and the prayers that they have deep down inside of them that they can barely even utter, but you know what they are because you hear us. Father God, I pray that you would just draw close this weekend. God, I pray that you would make your presence known. Father, I pray that you would make a way in the wilderness. God, I pray that you would make a way for us to be restored in Christ. God, we know you, you know the pain. You were tempted in the wilderness in every way that we were. We know that you know the pain. You went to the cross for us. 
God, we know that you see us. We know that you hear us. And I pray today that we would be able to see you and we would be able to hear you. And we would hear your message of hope and redemption cut through the noise of the mess of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.